Let's go ahead and begin in a prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for this time together that you have granted to us. Uh, this day is the only day we have. We don't have yesterday, we don't have tomorrow, we have today. So let us live in your presence and practice your presence in this day. And be aware uh, that we are, can, are called to trust the Father and to abide in the Son and to walk by the Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can see we're going to be now making a switch. Um, uh, we've been doing uh, the whole area of loving well, learning well, and living well. And as you know, those are three major comp components. So this whole idea of uh, loving uh, well, um, <coughs> so I'll just call it this way, uh, kind of being, being, knowing, and doing. The hands, the head, the heart. So it's an inside-out process, really bottom-up. So the concept of living well, loving well, learning well. And those are fundamental themes that are uh, effectively uh, the outline for all my content now. I've, I've organized it all, and the new website is going to really actually have those three categories. Every article, everything that we have will be tagged with one of those three categories uh, because I want us to be people who understand the um, dynamics of the, of the interior heart. And so this whole idea of, of excellence, we've talked about this before, but this is so absolutely critical that you live from this inside out and it's top down and, and bottom up in that respect, uh, top down, but um, ultimately the spiritual life then, spiritual excellence has to do with knowing him and um, moral excellence flows out of knowing him. So the concept then is that the fruit of the spirit, one way of defining moral excellence would be the fruit of the spirit. Uh, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and those are qualities that really uh, enhance any relationship, and therefore those produce relational excellence, you see. So when I'm walking in the power of the Spirit, I'm able to serve my, my bride far better than I could if I were walking in the power of the flesh. It's pretty obvious. And she'll always know if, it, if I'm walking in the flesh or not. It becomes obvious. But when you are walking by the Spirit, um, the joy of God, the love, the peace, the patience, kindness, goodness, those are factors that are necessary to enhance relationships. So I put these three categories spiritual excellence, moral excellence, and relational excellence under the uh, category, effectively, of what it means to, to love well. So as I see it in this manner then, I, I, I see it as this whole I idea of moving from the heart to the head to the hands, uh, from being to knowing to doing, uh, from loving to learning to living. And then when I put that together then, that's what I mean by loving well is those three categories of excellence. But then I add two more. The next one is theoretical excellence, and that has to do with how you think. And so you want to think well. You want to learn well. And so that's where you talk, touch on topics like apologetics, uh, topics of culture, topics of theology and doctrine, and all those other areas as well. So again, the heart cannot rejoice in what the mind rejects, and therefore it's ne needful for us to have a clear, clear, a warm heart and a, and a, a clear mind. And then uh, we live in such a way that that manifests itself in functional excellence. Functional excellence has to do with the work of your hands, with doing things with skill and dignity. Now, it's intriguing that there are many people who are functionally excellent and, and, per, and perhaps theoretically excellent, but who do not have the interior life. They give maybe lip service to it, but effectively, their focus is going to be on the outward exterior. My claim, on the other hand, is that it's the interior life that should energize and animate and empower the exterior life. So just to give you that, that concept. So as we're moving now from uh, a series we've just done recently on intelligent design, um, now we're moving into loving well. And I want to zoom into, when I think of loving well, conform to his image is my text that's really designed to help people process what that likes. I don't know if any, how many of you read that, but it's a book that um, I think could be of value to you if you haven't, because insofar as I look at a number of chapters, um, 12 facets rather, of the spiritual life. And this gem, which with multiple facets, has 12 that I count. 
And the first one is relational spirituality, and the last one is corporate spirituality, and I did that quite intentionally. So what my desire then was to bookend it with relationships because that's at the end of the day the most important thing. I was with a group, a dinner group last night and we were discussing the most important moments in our lives and the, the moments when we were touched with poignancy and the grace of God. And uh, what, what were the things that sum, that, sum that up, the, the life transforming moments? And often they're gonna be through, through the lens of beauty and intimacy and adventure and your greatest experiences of those three. So there were about 19 people. We ran, it was one long, long table, and we went around the table and described. And most of them had to do, no surprise, with relationships, though there were some that described ineffable beauty as well. And it made me realize that it would be very interesting for me to actually come up with a list myself of what are the greatest moments of beauty I've ever known. It'd be a very good exercise for you to try out because it's a history that God's given you. And sometimes he's given you the capacity to see something with clarity that you wouldn't otherwise have noticed. And so when's, what's the most beautiful sunset, for example? or sunrise that you've ever seen. And by doing so, you're kind of training yourself to look back on some great moments that God has graced you with. And then the second uh, area is going to be uh, intimacy. And because what are the greatest moments of intimacy you've known? And a lot of them mentioned things, for example, of how one, one person, she knew the, the, the moment she fell in love with the, the guy she's married to. And she described that moment. It was very unusual to hear the exact moment like that. Another describing the birth of her uh, of their uh, grandchildren. Another describing um, the um, connection that they had going for the years that they've known each other. But those were intimacy, weren't they? Moments of intimacy. And those, I have a rich array of those moments as well with groups of people who share a great deal of fellowship and richness together. And, and so that's a second area. And then the third one is adventure. What's the most fun thing you've ever done? And I would like you to consider as a little exercise, writing, taking those three categories and writing them out because I think it would be a very intriguing thing uh, because uh, the whole idea of, uh, of beauty and intimacy, I don't know if I have it here, um, it, but it, it's this, this, yeah, th these, these three here. Um, so I began to think about it. I came up with about six for each and it would just be a beginning. But by doing so, what you're doing is you're cultivating a sense of gratitude and actually making a memorial of certain moments that God has graced you with and we've forgotten. So we have to sometimes recall and review because the key to gratitude is remembering because one of the things we, f we do is we have a habit of forgetting. We take God's gra grace for due, as our due, for granted. One way we do that then is to cultivate and curate gratitude, which is a choice. It's not just an act of emotion. That's why I've listed that grat gratitude among the spiritual disciplines. And by doing that, then you record that and you give thanks to God for those things that he's granted you. So going back to that for a moment then, it was intriguing how so much of it was about relationships, not a surprise. So I bookended the 12 facets with relationships. Uh, I put paradigm spirituality second, and we've already done a little mini-series together on that. Because that is, to me, the journey of life itself, that you are a pilgrim and a wayfarer, a stranger, an alien, an exile. Uh, and, and as you are, then what does it mean, this earthbound life, this brief moment where you're being prepared in a soul-forming world for the world to come? And as we see it then, you've got to cultivate a temp an eternal perspective in this temporal arena. Otherwise, there's just the nothing but loss. Um, we want to realize, no, it goes on, it goes beyond that. And it's an anticipation of the joy that we have, but we've got to cultivate an appetite for heaven, an appetite for home. The third facet is disciplined spirituality. Uh, engaging in the historical disciplines, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on as we uh, take our study today, because to me, that's a very critical theme for us to uh, process. What it means to have these disciplines, because they relate to not so much trying, but more uh, to training, and training in righteousness is what we're trying to talk about here. So it's not a matter of trying, but training. What does training involve? when you want to gain a skill. Say you want to learn a language, you want to learn a sport, 
you want to learn uh, any number of things, maybe uh, me memorize something, what would it involve? Practice, practice, practice. practice. But practice, but it, 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 perfect practice uh, it, it makes the difference because it's, you can practice the wrong stuff. So perfect practice is what, uh, uh, so that you do the right things and go through the right steps and you're willing to make mistakes. You're willing to uh, have errors. So you're, you, but you don't throw, it up, throw your tennis racket down in despair, but you, you, you learn from the mistake, you pick up and you go from there. Um, as I have seen, I forget who, has, there are different uh, people who uh, this is attributed to, um, but it it's, has to do with uh, experience. And uh, good decisions come through experience. That comes from bad decisions. You see? So we have to actually be willing to make errors to attain, to achieve, to, to become proficient. So if we're thinking about this idea of, of uh, training in righteousness, and not time so much as your intention and what you're doing with that, that, that goes a long way to moving us in the, in the right direction. So in seeing this then, engaging in the historical disciplines, and so I want to talk first about uh, dependence and discipline because this is, we're all in the same uh, journey together. And what does it mean when you have a kind of a combination of both divine sovereignty and also human responsibility? And then what are the spiritual disciplines? So how we can pursue them. And I'm gonna zoom down into three particular uh, ones of engagement and two of, 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 of uh, abstinence. And so we'll be talking about that. So when we talk about dependence and discipline, because much of this life then is dependent upon him because you cannot do it on your own. This is something that God can do in you and through you, but you cannot make it happen unless you are dependent upon him. So as we see what this looks like, first of all, we have to think about what grace, the grace of God is all about this. Grace is opposed to earning. We're not talking about earning, but it is not opposed to effort. Do you, does that make sense to you? So in, do, engaging in effort, because nothing is going to happen spontaneously. You're not going to wake up and suddenly become spiritual. So there needs to be certain practices. And then the question is, what do you want? What do you seek? What do you, would you long to have? And it's this, this, these three questions that I've often been giving you in the past, in recent past, but I'm also beginning to think about my own life. M multiple times a day now, I ask these three questions multiple times. And so I can stop at any point and I can zoom down right at this moment, at this particular time, what do I want more than anything else? It's a great question to ask. What do I truly want? Because it's gonna force me to reflect upon my true desires because I become conformed to that to which I aspire. I become shaped by my desires. I, I need to have intentionality. And, and we need to have intention because otherwise we lose the cutting edge of action. So what do you intend? What do you seek? What do you long to have more than anything else? And then secondly, um, obviously it's going to be about him because then who is Jesus to me at this, very, at this moment? And then qu third question, do I love him more than these? And you fill in the these whatever it happens to be, any rival to your deepest affection, any rival of uh, your priorities, if he's not first, he will brook no rival. Now, the odd thing is he calls us to hate um, in comparison with himself, the one who does not hate his father and his mother. And his, how can that be? But it's not an absolute hatred. It's a relative. And by which he means that, in, that loving him is the most critical theme. And so to, to hate the others is not really an absolute thing. In fact, when I look at uh, photos of the sun and the photosphere of the sun, you'll see sunspots. And those sunspots appear to be dark by their very nature, but they're actually not. If you could isolate a sunspot and bring it away from the more brilliant photosphere, it would actually be quite bright. So it's not that the sunspot is not, uh, it, it, it's not that it's not bright. 
It's just that it's in comparison. And here's the point, and we've talked about this before. The best thing I can do for my wife, for my friends, for my children is to do what? Love Jesus more than them. That is the best thing I can do because he's not the enemy of your love. He's the energizer of it. So if I love, if I choose him above them, then I have all things in one, and then I have a greater capacity to love and serve them. So as I often put it, if I love Karen more than I love Jesus, then I will love her less than if I love Jesus more than Karen. That's just the nature of it. So he's not the enemy, but he will not have any rival. So the point is, when he's first and foremost, then he empowers you to love people as you are called to love them. So you're loving people correctly, you see, and properly. And so this is why this, in, um, uh, and it takes just a few seconds as a diagnostic. I do it several times a day, and I'd like you to try it yourself. To ask these three questions at any juncture, you can be driving, what do I seek right now? You see, it's a recalibration, isn't it? It's like a mini uh, adjustment. Well, what do I want more than anything else then? And so it's this whole idea of, of intentionality. Who, who do you say that I am? And that should be a growing vision. And do you love me more than these? And the these could be, you name it. Any person, situation, possession, whatever it happens to be. The other side of that coin, the other thing I, the trilogy I use is this. And I've been doing this uh, quite a bit as well. So I do these, both of these multiple times a day. So I'm going to turn this into a little card. And when I have a card, I'm going to give it to you because I would like you to try it. Any way I can give you a little tool to help you. But if I can just chew on these things right now, it can make an enormous difference because it, it gives me a perspective that I otherwise would not have. So it's a matter of grace. Um, it is, effort is not opposed to grace, earning is. This is not earning anything, it is actually training in righteousness. And the purpose of the disciplines, as I'll stress again and again, is not that they are ends in themselves, but rather they are means to the ends of intimacy with him. They are not to be, become just law-based uh, practices that you get into, and then you get into a rut and you're doing them, you, don't, you even forgot why you were doing them. But rather, you're doing them as a vehicle to knowing him. So prayer is a vehicle to knowing him. Study of the scriptures, renewing your mind, is a vehicle to knowing him. And loving others even is a vehicle to knowing him. And so everything you do can be a vehicle to knowing him. Now there are two clear extremes. One emphasizes God role, God's role more than the other, and the other emphasizes our role. And I think that you need to have a a balance here, because if we overemphasize our role in this process, it'll lead to a lot of efforts where we're striving for Jesus. A lot of people try to do things for him. You are doing this for him. I often tell people, stop doing things for Jesus and invite him to start doing things through you. There's a difference. Because now you are a receptivity in a modality of receptivity as a branch in the vine. You're receiving his life. You're not trying to create life and then give it to him. But rather, you don't create anything. You don't bring anything to the table. What you can do, though, is to receive. But then you do bring something to the table because his grace then actually is, flows through you. And through the prism of your personality, he accomplishes things through, through you and in a circumstance through you to which he's called you. And so he accomplishes things then through his power, but he's doing his, doing his things through you. But instead of striving for Jesus or overemphasizing human effort um, or the Holy Spirit being virtually ignored, which is often the case, because um, there's a, almost a spiritless approach where we almost have this uh, kind of a checklist approach to the spiritual life that you would not even know if the Spirit was there or not. The opposite extreme is when we overemphasize God's role so much that it leads to a form of passivity or perhaps to uh, so stress the supernatural that you're looking for, constantly looking for signs and wonders and after a while you can't live the uh, splendor in the ordinary and, and the, the, the routines of the daily life um, that we are called to do. And it downplays the human element. 
So the balance then is to really put the two together and have a balanced perspective. And it's found really in Philippians 2, 12 to 13. Because on the one hand, here Paul tells us, work out your salvation with fear and trembling on the one hand. But then he says, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's a powerful two-verse combination. Because you don't want to teach one verse without the other. Those two go together. So if I put the two together, I realize that uh, our role is to work out, not work for your salvation, by the way. He's not saying that. You couldn't achieve that in, if you, no matter, although people constantly try. You know what that's called? It's called religion, working out, their, working for their salvation. That's religion. I'm not interested in religion. When people ask me, are you a religious man? I say, what? I don't think so. What do you mean by that? What do you, so I often ask me, what do you mean by religion? What do you, uh, have you, have you uh, found God or something like that, you see, any, any number of things? Uh, have you got, got the fear of God? I've, all these crazy things. So I have to ask them, what do you mean by that? Because I'm not interested in religion. I'm not trying to work my way or achieve or merit or attain or, or, or impress or prove. But rather, it's a matter of a relationship and more, in another way of looking at it, is there's a romance where he's the one who's wooed and pursued me. So, so first of all, you're working out what he's worked in. It's your outworking of his inworking. So that he's given you all this grace. Now, what does that look like? How does that flesh out in terms of your thinking and practice? And so that's really what we're talking about here. And on the side of God's role, he gives you the desire and the empower, for it is God who is at work in you to do what? Both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So you see this divine human synergy. Are there questions on this concept? Because it's a very important balance to sustain. And we often slip to one extreme or the other. It's just the nature of, of, of our condition. Any, if there are any questions, just let me know, because um, this is, to me, an important balance. So I live in that tensioned interplay between the, the sovereignty of God and the, the, the uh, human freedom and responsibility that he's granted to me. When I put those together, then, I see that I must be dependent. On the other hand, um, as I must be disciplined. So dependence and discipline both go hand in hand. That, to me, is critical. Now, there's a lot of verses that I mention and conform to his image. And so when, I, when I'm talking about conformed, um, I go into the, uh, this, this revised edition here. And so I, I have a lot of verses that I do here. So when I go to the um, discipline spirituality, somewhere around here, two disciplines of abstinence and for, so forth here. So here we have um, uh, just what I've just been describing here. So we have this little list of of options for people to, to, to pursue and consider. So here, as an exercise, here are the passages that combine both uh, the interrelationship between the divine, the human and the divine, and the outworking of the Christian life. And so one of those great texts that I, 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 that I love to use is John 14. Whoop, wrong color. Let me get this color here. Yeah, that's better. Un undo that. Now I'll make it that way, yeah. John 14, 15 to 17, an incredible text for us to consider, as well as John 15, 4 to 11, and 26 to 27. All of these are rich and powerful, and so they combine together really to give us a, a, a combined sense of all these balances. It would be good to see what those look like and how that works out in our life. So on the side of dependence, the life of Christ cannot be achieved by human effort but only by divine enabling. That is a ment uh, an immensely important uh, perspective that is developed in the scriptures. And therefore, apart from me, you can do a few things. What does he say? Apart from you, me, me, you can do nothing. What does that mean? Can't you build a business without him? Surely, men have done it all throughout history. You've run com uh, companies and, and nations and so forth. You've had families. You've done all kinds of enterprises. What does it mean you can't do anything? What do you think that means to you? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, but yet you can, but yet you can't. What am I asking? I'm saying that the thing, you cannot do anything that will bring life of, a, of your own. You can't create life. 
you can only receive life, his life, and then you can manifest that life and reflect his life. And so it's his life in you, living as you, through you. And so you don't create. He is the one who creates. He's the initiator. And yet he does not want automata. He wants people who are willing agents, who are volitional agents, who are, who are training their will, so they're training it in righteousness. So you, you develop your will through practice. Often, I, and you've heard me say that uh, many people have anemic intentions, that is to say they don't want enough. They actually settle for the promises of the world, and it's just too thin a gruel. No, we need more than what the world can provide. People need to have some desire. What do you value? What do you long for? What do you hope for? What do you dream about? So get into touch with those deep longings that are in our heart because nothing earthbound can sustain them or satisfy them. So having a greater desire until you finally realize that we des our problem is we don't desire enough. And so we can begin to desire the one thing that could not ever be provided for in this world, that which is transtemporal and transfinite. And so to know him, to desire him, is greater than anything that we could have on this world. So what do you desire then? To have a greater desire. You've made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. So make it then the restless heart that desires the one person who can satisfy you because you were made for him and by him and you were made for a purpose and he's determined the works that he wants you to create and uh, so that he's actually given you a purpose in this world but what do you desire and so that question but then secondly if they have anemic desires that will lead to, to, to uh, as I put it a sloppy thought life and uh, they expose themselves to things that, that are unworthy of them. And their thought lives are sloppy as well because they're not disciplining them. Because they, they are not training themselves for something better than this world can provide. Desiring so much that only God can make it happen. And so they have sloppy thought lives. And then that third leads to, uh, to flabby wills, as I put it. A flabby will, then, is, not, is one that's anemic. It's not strong because it's not been exercised. So uh, much of this has to do with training in righteousness to train your will and to continue to do that and to press on in spite of opposition to the contrary. So apart from him, we can accomplish nothing. This is the side of dependence. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. This text in Galatians then talks about this whole idea of keeping in step with the Spirit of God. And that is why I, that little trilogy I just gave you, trust the Father, Abide in the Son, walk by the Spirit. You can summon it up in a moment. You can do it at any time when you're talking with someone anywhere. Try to train yourself to become habituated with certain practices that can serve you well. Because you see, these are not ends in themselves, but they are means. They are good servants, but they're poor masters. So you want these things to serve you. So walking by the Spirit, trust the Father, abide in the Son. What do I do with the Spirit? I walk by Him. I keep in step with Him. I walk in His power. And that is uh, the idea, because when you walk by the Spirit, then you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And insofar as you're walking by the Spirit, you are actually now filled with the Spirit who gives you his qualities of Christ-likeness, which are, again, love, joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Another text he gives us in, in verse, twi verse 25. He says here, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And it's a slightly different, it's a different word for walk, but it has to do with the detailed activities. So I can then really seek to practice his presence. And one of the things I think that you can do is to train yourself in this way is for you to invite the Spirit to actually guide you into your prayers as to who you might pray about. Have you ever done that, where you just stop, instead of giving him a list, you just pause and say, bring to mind the people you would want me to intercede for, to pray for. And I have discovered that when you invite the Spirit to do that, he, he'll give you He'll put a name here or something like that. And sometimes he'll give you a prompting, and that prompting might correspond with the need for you to 
contact that person. So there's an action that may be required as well. But I think the more you quietly uh, attend to the voice of the Spirit, because His voice is very quiet, but the more you attend to it and train yourself to hear that voice, the more you will be attuned to it. But how do you amplify the voice of the Spirit? The answer is obedience. Obedience is the pathway, the portal of divine disclosure. You want to you wanna become like him? Do what I call you to do. Because if you do what I call you to do, then it shows you that you do, in fact, trust me enough to do what I ask you to do. So obedience is based upon trust, which is based upon love, which is based upon knowledge. But not knowledge in the head, but rather experiential, personal, relational knowledge. So this kind of obedience is then obedience to one. You're beginning to, you've developed a history. You see, here's what we're doing. You're building a history of your relationship with the living God. And so this sacred history has its ups and its downs. But there are, there are troughs and there are mountains. And there are moments that God will give you of grace, and it is good to note those. There are some uh, moments in your life, these um, whole idea of, of the um, uh, Ebenezer. You remember that phrase, here I raise my Ebenezer? What is an Ebenezer? What is that, what is that to you? Anyone remember what that, what that term means? It's, a, it's in a hymn, as you know. What's an Ebenezer? It's an, old, it's an Old Testament image there. It was a rock in the Old Testament, and it was used as a memorial. It was a memorial stone. So, in a, so I like the idea of an Ebenezer in this sense that you're memorializing an act of God is what you were doing there. Well, I think it's, we do very well to review and memorialize <clears throat> the acts of God in your life, to build a sacred history and to, and to note those things well. Just as I told you before, wouldn't it be smart for you to write down a list of the most intimate moments you've ever known, the most beautiful moments you've ever known, and the most fun moments you've ever known, adventurous. Wouldn't it be interesting to see that? Because then you'll realize, looking back, that those were all graces and gifts that we have often overlooked and taken for granted. That's why gratitude will erode very quickly. It has a short half-life. Nothing ages more quickly than gratitude. As I like to put it, um, with the passing of time, grace degenerates into entitlement. What have you done for me lately? It's a terrible mindset. Here we are wealthy beyond imagination compared to the vast number of people on this planet who have lived in the past, especially in the past. It's a, I have to tell you, this is not an easy time to live in many ways, but I wouldn't p pick any other time. I think this is most, we are seeing the end of days and we're seeing some things that are astonishing and we are privileged to see um, all things being prepared for the coming of our Lord. And I think he's really working on that. I'm not, therefore, I'm not wringing my hands in despair. Parenthetically, I often tell people, you, are, you do better to be known for what you love than for what you hate. So you want to be known for your loves. You want to be known as a person who pursues and loves beauty and pursues and loves goodness and pursues and loves truth. Those, because there's something, a, a quality then, when a person evinces this gratitude, this contentment, this sense of um, God's ownership. Chapter 23 in Conform to His Image. If you read only one chapter, I probably would have you read that one. Chapter 23. It's, it's called uh, Gratitude and Contentment. Very few people have them. And I would love for you to be one who has gratitude. That they're choices, you see. They're not emotions. They are episodes where you choose the way of gratitude by pausing, remembering those Ebenezers, remembering those moments, and getting a perspective, especially when you're going through internal turmoil in your, in your life journey. So there will be times, as you know, when the, the uh, Psalms of Lament Will, will take place, and they will actually record their re re the lament. And it was written to music. And these psalms of lament will cry out to God and say, Daddy, why are, is this allowed to happen? So it is, in fact, the why of grief. And it has a place, because we don't understand. But it's not a why of grumbling. Grumbling doesn't do anything. Why me? Why not you? We're in a fallen world. 
but rather why of grief though, you do share your heart with, with God. And we all have barriers and things we say, I don't understand. But when he's inviting us not to understand him, I can't understand one thing in his created order. You think I'm gonna understand the spiritual realm? But at the same time though, he invites me to trust him though I cannot understand him. So the, the why of, 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 of grief is there, but there's another why that we often overlook. And it's the why of guidance, the why of guidance. This is more infrequent, but much more helpful. Because what is the why of guidance doing? It's taking the pain, the problem, the issue, and you're turning it from a why me into what am I to learn? Instead of asking God to take away the problem, you're asking him to show you what he's teaching you in it. So rather than try, praying that he changes the circumstances, you're inviting him to change you and your perspective on the circumstances. Because you see the circumstances are going to be interpreted either in terms of the unchanging character of God or they'll be in term, in, uh, or we'll look at God and view him in view of our changing circumstances. Then when things are going well, you're in a spiritual roller coaster because you're, you're, you're praising him then, but then you're wondering about him then. So wouldn't it be better for me to ask, God, what are you teaching me in this process? Because suffering is a vehicle that he uses to draw us into intimacy with God. The three primary things he uses, in my view, is the word of God and all its variations and the, the vehicles by which we can expose ourselves to the renewing of, of the mind. But also, the second is the prayer in which we respond to God. So last week, I gave you this poem by George Herbert. Prayer, the church's banquet, angel's age, God's breath and man returning to his birth, the soul in paraphrase, heart and pilgrimage, the Christian plummet sounding heaven and earth, engine against the almighty, sinner's tower, reverse thunder, Christ's side piercing spear, the six days world transposing in an hour, a kind of tune which all things hear and fear, softness and grace and love and joy and peace, bliss, exalted manner, and gladness of the best, heaven and ordinary, where men, man well dressed, the Milky Way, the bird of paradise, church bells beyond the stars uh, heard, the soul's blood, the land of spices, something understood. And I taught that, and I, I explicated each of those 26 metaphors. I wonder if there's not one, I don't know, for each letter of the alphabet, I wouldn't be surprised. But the richness of that poem is, defies imagination, because what he's trying to say is prayer is a banquet. It is a Eucharistic concept, context. It is which we get to know him and become like him. So the word of God in prayer, but the third thing he uses to really draw us to him is suffering. And it is needful because you cannot become like him unless you, in fact, um, go through the adversities that are needful for us to be formed, for Christ to be formed and forged in us so that he, in fact, is shaping us and preparing us in this soul-forming world for our eternal home in, in, in heaven, in his presence. So this is, is this whole idea of living and walking by the Spirit then, the vehicles that God uses. So as I said before, my best approach to this, hearing the voice of the Spirit, is obedience. So when I obey a, a quiet nudge, a prompt, a, just, I'm not sure, but it's a little prompting, follow it. And you will find that you will know him better as a consequence, in my view. This is where I go back to the John 14 text, because there I see um, in John, uh, in, in 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So you have, amazingly, when, in the upper room, remember, this is his last will and testament almost, as he knows in less than 24 hours he'll be on the cross. And he's, he's sharing these thoughts with these disciples, and you and I are privileged to listen in. And three times he says that's a nota bene when he repeats himself. When the Lord repeats himself, there's a reason. So the first time he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But then look at verse 21. There, here he says, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. What does he say was going to happen as a result of that? I will love him and will disclose. So obedience is, in fact, the mode of divine disclosure. If you keep them, then I will disclose myself to you. Yet he, again, he says it, now in verse 23, comes it from a different way. 
In verse 21, he says, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. In verse 23, he says, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. So he does it backwards. But it's the same idea. My father will love him, and what will happen? We, the father and the son, will come to him and make our abode with him. So that obedience, once again, is clearly seen, all three of these texts, verse 15, and then in verse 21 and 23. He is saying obedience is the portal to divine disclosure. If you want to know him, do what he calls you to do. And that to, me, that, that, to me, is an incredibly important exercise for us to follow. So to walk by the Spirit, to listen to his promptings, and to apply them, in my mind, is a very critical uh, motif for us to do. So the idea of discipline is the one hand and dependence on the other. Jesus, we well know, walked in the power of the Spirit. If you just did a study of the Holy Spirit and his role in Jesus' life, it's constantly mentioning the connection there. He walked in total dependence upon the Father. And by the same sense, we don't create life. We receive life and display it. So the beautiful metaphor, this, this whole idea of the vine and the branches. So what you have is a, is a portrait, don't we, of how he is the, the vine. We don't create life as a branch, but we are connected to the vine. And insofar as we are, then we have the life of the vine in the sap. It goes into the branch. And then the branch, which is alive because of that, at the end of the branch, what do you have? If it's a fruit tree, you have fruit. I'm a little hint. What color is a greenback? Whose who's, who, who's face is on the Lincoln penny? Uh, but, uh, great, great questions, these. It's amazing. Some people actually will miss those. But um, the, the idea of knowing him and becoming like him, so you don't create that life, though. You actually receive his life and then display it, and what fruit is, is excess life. The branch doesn't need the fruit to live, but it's the abundance of life that goes through the branch that is now manifested. And what are the two things that fruit does? You're awfully quiet today. I can't get a peep out of you. What, is a, what does fruit do? It does two things. Come on, you know what they are. What's that? It nourishes. Fruit nourishes. And secondly, it has the fruit, the seed of its own reproduction. So that's now what you have is this nourishment is, is discipleship, reproduction, evangelism. You see, so the fruit then is actually going to both feed and also reproduce. The, 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 and a whole, my, the, the museum of beauty that I'm wanting to create I'll have a whole room, a building of skiffs with seeds because it's the most marvelous thing. The more you learn about the various ways in which God does this, it, it is almost, it's, it is mind-boggling the more you learn about it. But my point is that we receive life and we, uh, we display it and that becomes our way of dependence upon him. So the discipline of God, there's no growth apart from discipline and self-control. But there's also the need for uh, the com combination. So you're to discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. So it's a purpose, a calling, an intention, a desire that we are to call to pray. So spirituality is not something instantaneous. It's not haphazard, but it is developed. We'll stop with that and pick it up next week. Lord, we thank you for this time together and ask that you'd guide us into all truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen.